This morning I'm going to be looking at, at Romans chapter 1. If you would like to turn there with me, please. As you've noticed, I've been preaching a series during the course of this year of different ways for us to be looking at things for the course of the year, focusing on prayer and focusing on the Lord's faithfulness and how he answers prayer and all of that. This morning I'd like to be looking at this particular chapter. I'm not going to look at the whole chapter. We'll focus in finally on just a couple of verses. But uh, as we do, we'll be looking at from the standpoint of what Paul has to say about the gospel. In Romans chapter 1, Paul begins in the first verse by talking about how he is an apostle that is set apart for the gospel of God. Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Paul begins by talking about the fact that he is set aside for the gospel and for the ministry of the gospel at the beginning of this tremendous book that has so much theological truth that's woven through its pages. It's a tremendous book, the book of Romans, and all that Paul has dealing with fallenness, dealing with the Jews, dealing with the Gentiles, uh, dealing with justification, dealing with so many different aspects of theology and, under, and truth that we need to understand about God. But in the first chapter, Paul is beginning to write this particular letter to believers that he has not met yet, uh, living in the city of Rome. And as Paul starts out, he speaks about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's been set aside for the gospel. Down in verse 9, Paul mentions that, For God, whom I serve in my spirit, and the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you. And so Paul He's on this theme. He's going to mention it again. We can jump down to verse 15, and Paul writes, So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. And so Paul is over and over again emphasizing the gospel. Verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. So Paul emphasizes the gospel a great deal. For those of you men that are in the men's Bible study that meets a couple of times per month, I am trying to, be, trying to encourage you to look for different things in your own Bible reading. And one of the things that we encourage you to look for is for repeat words that show up again and again. And certainly the gospel shows up again and again in this particular passage. But when we, look at, we think about the gospel today, we often think about how the gospel is something that has to be presented to people that don't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They have to hear the gospel, the good news. You know that the gospel stands for good news. I'm sure you've heard it before. And we realize that the gospel is what we have to share with the unsaved, with those that haven't trusted Christ as the Lord and Savior. And we believe that and we understand that. We recognize the importance of the gospel. But as we look at the book of Romans, as we have observed before, as Paul's writing to believers in Rome, he is writing to people that have already believed the gospel. He's not writing to the unsaved, but yet he wants to come and he wants to preach the gospel to them. In verse 6, Paul says, I'm writing to you among whom also you are the called of Jesus Christ. The people in Rome to whom he's writing have been called. In verse 7, he says, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. So Paul recognizes that the people to whom he's writing are believers already. They've already trusted Christ in some way. Verse 8, he says, First, I thank God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. So again, Paul is recognizing that these believers in Rome not only are believers, but they have a reputation. People have heard about them throughout the whole world. These are not just some little remote corner, but these are the believers that their reputation is spoken about. They have a testimony that has gone beyond their own borders. Verse 12, Paul mentions, that is that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. In verse 12, Paul identifies that there's a reciprocity that he anticipates as he has occasion to be with them, both that they will minister to him as well as he hopes to them. 
So there are multiple places here where Paul is also referencing the fact that these people to whom he's writing, they're believers, they have a reputation, they have something that they can offer him that he can gain from just in having time with them, and Paul is looking forward to that time that he'll have occasion to be with them. And yet, as he's mentioning all these things, and in verses 11 and 12, he's mentioned about how he hopes to impart this, and they will also minister to him. Verse 12, that is that I may be encouraged, that uh, I may be encouraged together with you, while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. You look at verse 11 and 12, and Paul is very definitely saying that what God has done in their hearts is something that is going to minister to his soul, he anticipates, as he has occasion to come to them and spend time with them there in Rome. But then we come down to those verses that I mentioned earlier about the gospel, verse 15 and 16 and 17. So for my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. And when Paul says that, there is some element that Paul anticipates that if he is going to be encouraged by them and built up in the faith by spending time, uh, by spending time together, Paul is now saying that when I come, I want to preach the gospel to you. And so this is a, a little bit different way of looking at it from how we commonly think about the gospel. We know the gospel needs to be preached to the unsaved. And here Paul is saying, I want to encourage you and minister to you by preaching the gospel to you who are already saved and brothers and sisters and from whom I hope to be encouraged just by the time that I spend among you. I give this as a background as this first part of Romans chapter 1. After Paul talks about how he's not ashamed of the gospel and he's anxious to preach it, he then goes on in the following verses to talk about how God's wrath is likewise revealed. In verse 18, he writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And Paul begins there and he goes into a, a lengthy discourse about how they have rejected the truth about God that God has chosen to reveal to them. And because of how they've rejected the truth and chosen not to believe what God has revealed about himself, because of those reasons, God has given them over. And we can see passage after passage where God, and verse after verse later on, God gave them over to this, God gave them over to that, God gave them over to these things because they've rejected God completely and all the truth that's about him. In verse 25 specifically, he says they've exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than create the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So Paul recognizes that, they've, that the world that has chosen to reject God, that God is full of wrath toward them. Now as we look at this whole passage today, and we look, we're going to look specifically at verses 16 and 17, as we look at this, the challenge that I would bring to you today, as I've begun each of the messages this year with the beginning phrase, let your year begin and be filled with. I don't change that slightly today, but let your year begin and your life be filled with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you need. That's what I need. That's what we all need. We need to come back to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. As Paul was anticipating going to minister to the believers in Rome, he anticipated that this was how he could have his part in encouraging and lifting them up was the preaching of the gospel, of which he wasn't ashamed. As we look at this in verse 16, I would share with you that you need the power of the gospel in your life. And Paul recognized this as he speaks about the power of the resurrection, the power of the gospel, there in verse 16. Verse 16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. As we would look at this verse, as we would get started, I would observe that you need the gospel for salvation. And that's absolutely essential. Paul speaks later about how there's the wrath of God, verse 18, that is toward all unrighteousness. We can see in the uh, following verses that God is going to judge all in verse 24 and 26 and 28 and 32, we can look down through those verses and see God's going to bring judgment on the world for multiple reasons as God's turned them over in this direction or in that direction. But the blessing that we have 
that you know, that you've heard before, that was before when, when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, is that Romans chapter 5, verses 6 and 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God commendeth his love toward us. God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were totally unworthy, God chose to send Jesus Christ, his son, to die on the cross in our behalf. Unfortunately and sadly, many people that are rebelling and rejecting the truth that God has revealed don't think that they're bad enough that they really need to have a savior. They don't think that they really need Jesus Christ to die on the cross on their behalf. They think that, well, if they do enough good works, they'll outweigh the bad works, and hopefully that God will look favorably upon and weigh out the good versus the bad. And on those scales, like you see on almost every courthouse, that eventually their good, hopefully, will outweigh the bad, and that, that's good enough to get them into heaven. But in doing so, they reject the righteousness that comes by faith, the righteousness that comes by putting their trust not in their works, not in that the, hopefully one will weigh, weigh the bad, but rather in what Jesus Christ and the finished work that he has done on the cross. There's no one that is justified. No one is righteous based upon their own works. We look then at John chapter 3, verse 16, the familiar verse that uh, even for people that may never have trusted Christ as their Savior, they've heard it and seen it so many times. Many, even non-believers, might know that particular verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The verse begins, though, with God as the actor. God is the one that's in control. It starts off with not a anthropocentric perspective based on man in the center, but rather it's a theocentric with God in the center. It is God who's the active agent, and God is the one that acts and works. In our own fallenness and humanity, we think that surely it must depend upon me and my perspective. Certainly, you can say, you believe the way you want to, and I'll believe the way I want to. I'm sure many of you have talked to people. Maybe you felt that way sometime in the past. And some of my you try to share their faith with them, and they say, well, that's good for you. You can go ahead and believe that. Meanwhile, they're going to take a different perspective, and they say they don't have to accept it. They don't have to believe that. But when you look at John 3.16, it begins with God so loved the world. We have to go back to the beginning and recognize God's authority and control over all things. It's very important, I think, in sharing the gospel today, not to just start in the middle of Romans with a verse, but to go back to the beginning and recognize that God is the one that's the creator over all. He's the one that spoke the worlds into existence. He spoke man into existence, and he created man in his own image and his likeness, as we can see in Genesis chapters 1 and chapter 2. The problem came in Genesis chapter 3, where Adam and Eve chose to disobey God's direct command that they were not to eat of the fruit of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. And because of that, and their sin, they were judged as a consequence. And as Paul tells us in Romans, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. God had said that in the day that you eat thereof, that particular tree, you will surely die. But man chose to believe the lie of Satan that said instead, no, you will not surely die. But because they disobeyed God, accepted what Satan had said, judgment passed upon them. And we can see in Genesis chapter 3 as it unfolds, that they were uh, eliminated, removed from having access to the garden. They were sent out. And that's the condition of fallenness that then befell, that came upon all of their descendants, all of mankind, all of us from that very start, that as we were made and as we came from Adam and Eve, then we have inherited that same guilt that comes from that disobedience. But it's not just the guilt of Adam and Eve's sin. We also have our own, as we continuously, as fallen creatures, have chosen and choose to sin. And our sin is what separates us from God. And so we have great need for forgiveness. That's only because of what Christ has done for us. So John 3.16, God so loved the world. God is the one that loved us in our fallenness, even though we had chosen to disobey him, even though we had chosen to reject his commandments, even though we stand guilty because of the Ten Commandments that, before, that are before us. We stand guilty because of our own sinfulness that we have, 
God chose to send his son, John 3.16, but God loved the world so much that God, as he saw that man had fallen, determined before eternity, before the world even began, he had a purpose and he had a plan. He knew that man was going to fall. He knew this was going to happen. But his love was so great, his grace was so great, he was so worthy of the praise of man for how he would show and demonstrate his love, even to a fallen word that chose to reject him. And in spite of all that, he chose to save us by his son. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so we see in John 3.16, the gospel, that God chose to save us because of what Christ has done. But the end of John 3.16 is that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you read John 3.16, you get to the last part, the last uh, part of that. God did his part and was motivated by his love that sent his son. The son, as you remember, there in the garden was willing to submit to the Father's will and said, not my will, but yours be done. He, he prayed there in the garden. His disciples were there, and he went, and they had fallen asleep, and he went back and forth, but he prayed three times, Lord, if it be possible, may this cup be removed from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He submitted willingly to take upon himself all of your sins, all of my sins, all the sins of mankind and the guilt of all of that sins from eternity, not eternity, but from creation all the way up and all the way future, he took upon himself all the sins of mankind so that whoever believes in him will not have to pay for his or her own sins because Christ paid for them at, at, in his death on the cross. So we can see there that you need the gospel for salvation. The gospel, the good news, must be accepted by faith. That comes out in the next verse when we get to it, verse uh, 17, when we get, we're not there yet, but when we get to it. But we also need the gospel as a believer. In verse 15, Paul had said, I, for my part, am eager to preach the gospel to you. Not only was the gospel necessary for the salvation of the believers in Rome, and not only did you need the gospel when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, looking back in time and reflecting upon when you trusted Christ, whether you were a child, whether you were a teenager, whether you were a young adult or a middle adult or an older adult, whatever, wherever you were, when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you needed the gospel at that particular point. But it didn't stop and it didn't end at that time. And Paul wants to preach it to the believers there in Rome. The recipients in Rome were already saved. Christ, the Christian life, must be lived in the gospel and it is all of Christ and Christ alone. Our lives must be based upon what Christ has done. But in verse 17, we can see that that's tied into faith. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. But the righteous man shall live by faith. Unfortunately, in our country and in some other countries and parts of the Western world, there are different ways by which people might express or show that their, con their conversion experience. It sometimes, in some places, after some sermons, might be with the raising of a hand, might be with a person being urged to walk down an aisle, might be urged to stay wherever they happen to be sitting and just to make a decision to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But it's not just a matter of going through the motions on the outside. A person has to have believing faith in the efficacy and the work of Jesus Christ on the cross in order for that person to be saved. You need to be saved by faith in Christ and Christ alone. Whether you've ever done something, said something, raised your hand, prayed a prayer after somebody else, or anything else along those lines, you need to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, and your faith must be fully in him. As verse 18 points out, that the righteous man shall live by faith. It is by faith and faith alone in the finished work of Christ. And however you may have ended up being here today, if it, you believed that you had did something, prayed something, whatever it was, if you weren't putting your faith and trust in Christ, in Christ alone, you need to re-examine and look back at that. And I would be remiss if I didn't challenge you in that way. But if I challenge you in that way, it is for the salvation of your soul that you be rightly saved and trust in Christ as your Savior and not some outward act that we might have instituted in how we do church or preach revivalism in our country.
It's by Christ and Christ alone. But Christ and the gospel, which is by faith, is also how we're to live our lives. And that's how you and I as believers need to be living now. It is by faith and the finished work of Christ. A person doesn't come to a relationship that's right with God because of his works, and neither does a person live his or her Christian life on the basis of works. Your standing before God is not based upon what you do. Your standing before God is based upon the finished work of Christ on the cross. It's by faith in him and his work on the cross that you and I stand. Paul elaborates later in the book of Romans about how we are justified, we are made right because of faith. But all of what I've been sharing so far has been focusing upon us as individuals, but it also applies for the church. As Paul's writing to the believers there in Rome, he's not writing to one individual believer. He's writing collectively to the believers that are collected there in Rome. And we need the gospel to be central for Berean Bible Church going forward. For our church as we go forward, for however the Lord might lead us as a church, as a body of believers, the gospel has to be the central focus. And the element of the gospel from man's perspective is accepting and going forward by faith. From God's perspective, it's motivated by love. From man's perspective, we have to look at it by faith. It's by faith that we put our faith, our trust, our hope. And so it is not just a personal, but it's a corporate response. Jesus loved and died for the church. I'd like for you to turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul, like opposite sides of a coin that you flip back and forth, heads and tails. I mean, in a coin, you flip it over. You can have the head side or the tail side of the coin. Paul appears to do that sort of a thing in what he is doing in Ephesians chapter 5 as he speaks about the relationship between a husband and his wife and Christ and the church. And first he's speaking about one, then he's speaking about the other, then he goes back to the other, he goes back and forth between the two. You can see that in Ephesians 5, uh, verses 22 and following. I'm going to pick up with verse 25, though. In verse 25, Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present it to himself, the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So Paul speaks there to Christ and the church and what he did. Then he flips to the other side. So husbands ought also to love their wives as their own bodies. And he'll go back and forth between the two reflecting upon the parallel between husband and wife in Christ and the church. He goes back and forth. Like I said, it's like two sides of a coin, the heads and the tails back and forth. But what I would want to call your attention to is the active work of Christ. As Christ is working his will in the believers that make up, compose the church. Those verses there, verse 25, he loved the church, gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her. In other words, make her holy, set her apart. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, and there's a process here going place. There's something that Christ is doing. He is accomplishing his will. And as we would look at the church, that's the ongoing work of the gospel and the process of the church. It's the ongoing work of God of transforming, of sanctifying, of setting apart. And so for Berean Bible Church, or for any church, Jesus Christ is in the process of doing his will, his work in the church. But from our perspective, it must be by faith, because it's God's work, not ours. It's God's power, not ours. It's what God is accomplishing. Your salvation wasn't through anything that you did. You didn't earn it. You didn't accomplish it. You didn't have the good stuff outweigh the bad stuff. It was by faith that you accepted what Christ did. It was the work that God did that we accept by faith. And as a church, we need to look forward to what God will do as we go forward by faith. We need the gospel, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, salvation, as he chooses to, as God saves us. A believer uh, needs this, and we need this as well. The church and the believer needs this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But going on to verse 17, in verse 17, I would observe 
this other element, that you need the key element of the gospel, faith, to steer your relationship with God. The thing is that we as fallen humans, we are so used to trying to earn our way or get things our own way that we, first of all, before we're saved, we think that hopefully we can get on God's good side, get enough good to outweigh the bad, whatever it is, if we can just do this, or depending upon some religious traditions, they have all sorts of uh, both pilgrimages and other sequences that a person can go through that they can make or do for themselves that, that hopefully will give them extra cred credentials before deity. Unfortunately, though, the way we're wired, even after we're saved, we think, oh, I can do this for God. Oh, I can do this for God or I can do this for God, and God will look upon me favorably because I have done this for him or done that for him, even after we're saved. But the gospel still must guide the church and us as believers on this side of Calvary. If we look at these verses, Paul points out that the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. You need the key element of the gospel, faith, to steer your relationship with God. Righteousness of God is always by faith. As I mentioned earlier, love is the key element in the gospel from God's perspective, whereas faith is a key element in the gospel from man's perspective. God, by his love, has shown his love toward you and toward me. But now we have a responsibility also to go forward by faith in him. It's not that we earn anything by going forward by faith. It's not that it's accomplished by going forward by faith. But all of our lives as God's children must be by faith in what Christ and Christ alone has done. On the other hand, we have to recognize God's love that has been shown toward us. We love him because he first loved us. What did Jesus tell his disciples? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, by the love which you show one toward another. Over and over again in the New Testament, the, the writers of the epistles say, love one another. Jesus Christ commanded his disciples to love one another. We have a responsibility then, as God has saved us by his grace, as we've been redeemed by the blood of his son, as his love has been manifest to us, our love is to be shown then to one another within the context of the church. So the setting of the church going forward is to be a setting whereby as God would direct our steps for Berean Bible Church or for any other church, it ought to be characterized by a love that the believers have one for another. Because this is the outworking of God's love that was first demonstrated and manifested toward us at Calvary and now is to work through us toward one another. So for the future for Berean Bible Church, however God chooses to direct our steps, it needs to be with the gospel as central. For us in our lives as Christians, for us to grow in him, it needs to be with the gospel as operative and working in our lives. It is God's love shown toward you and shown toward me. We need to realize that I only am what I am as a child of God. Whoever you are, wherever you're sitting, or wherever you're watching or listening later, wherever you happen to be, you only are what God has made you to be because God is the one that has worked there in your heart and your life. There's nothing that's been earned or gained. It's because of his power. And when we appreciate and recognize what God has done in transforming and changing and sanctifying us, when we realize that and can come before him with faith, with appreciation and thanks and humility, then we are in a much better position for God to then guide us and show us how he's going to have and use us in the future as we rest and trust in what he has done in us. This morning, my challenge for you to summarize is let your year begin and your life be filled with the gospel. It applies at the personal level. It applies at the church level. Because the transforming power of God to work in lives shows itself as we are redeemed by the blood of Christ, when we are changed because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and then as the church is perfected and cleansed and grows as Jesus Christ works among it. Paul, in another place in Ephesians, talked about how the whole church looks to Jesus Christ as the head, and we are all parts. Paul uses the illustration of the body in another place in the New Testament. He says, the hand can't say to the foot, I have no need of you. He says, the ear can't say to the eye, I have no need of you. 
We all have been given different gifts. You've been given a gift for the profit with all of everybody in the body of the church to be used for his glory. And the purpose is for us to then use the gifts God has given us for the growth and the edification of the body, as Paul tells us there in Ephesians, as we collectively look to Jesus Christ as our head, the Lord, the one that's over the whole body. Going forward, for Berean Bible Church this year, I would challenge you, let your year begin and your life be filled with the gospel of Jesus Christ, recognizing as the power of God unto, as Paul says here, that I'm not ashamed of the power of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we come before you. We are overwhelmed with the majesty, the awesomeness of what you have presented to us. You chose to send your son to die on the cross. He who was fully equal with you in deity, power, glory, and authority, who spoke the worlds into existence and by whom all things consist, the one who is over all chose to be made a man, part of the human material world, a part of the creation. He who has no part of creation or the material world became part and humbled himself to that, and then to be born of Mary, and then to suffer and take all of the abuse and all of the rejection and suffer on the cross to die on our behalf. He bore our sins and his body on the tree that we might be redeemed and made righteous in thy st- uh, by, by your dec- declaration. Father, we thank you for what you have done in justifying us by the blood of your Son. And Lord, we worship you. We praise you. We thank you for your great love that's been shown to us. Lord, I would pray that if there be anyone here that might, in reflection on his or her relationship with you, might realize that he may never have fully trusted in the complete work of Christ, but instead might have crust- trusted something else. Oh God, bring conviction to that soul, I pray. Draw that one to yourself. And Lord, I pray that everyone here will trust and put his or her faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross completely for salvation. And I pray that you'll guide us individually and as a corporate body, as a church, to go forward by faith, faith in you, trust in you going forward. May the gospel be characteristic in all that we choose to do here as individuals in a church. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.